let's get into the sermon. You guys ready? We have a new sermon series. It's called I Church. I Church. I am the church. I am part of the church. That's what the I stands for. But what is the church for? We are going right now through a uh, a, a teaching series uh, too on, on Wednesday nights is going to start this coming Wednesday, where we talk about countercultural. We are surrounded by a culture that there is. It feels like it is a free for all. Uh, everybody just does whatever seems right in their own eyes. But what is the task of the church? What is our task? What is our voice? And we have a, a manual for life. Do we dare to stand on it? A- amen. Right. We do dare to stand on it. That is our manual for life. And so we're going through this. And or at the same time on Sundays now, I'm going through a, a sermon series that's called I Church. And I, I go by the, the letters uh, in Revelation. You have seven letters to seven churches. Um, and we're right now in Revelation chapter 2. So if you have your Bibles with you, go ahead and, and open to Revelation chapter 2. And I want to bring it back to this picture of the lampstand standing in the middle of the room. Remember, we had a uh, last week as I, I started talking about Ephesus. Did you get something out of that? The church that lost some odd track of their own first love. You know, the Lord, we have this picture about Jesus Christ in the heavenly realm walking among seven lampstands. Now, those seven lampstands are representing seven churches of Asia Minor. Uh, today, we talk about the second one. Last week, we talked about Ephesus. Ephesus was somehow a strange church that had to go through a lot of things. And remember the lampstand, the lights symbolizing each one of us, right? Bump your neighbor and says, one of those lights is you. That's right. One of those lights is you. And Jesus said, uh, shine your light before man, because God wants to shine his light uh, before man, right? And he's doing this through us, amen? And we're all part of the lampstand. And so last week, we talked about the church in Ephesus, how the Ephesus summer went through a lot of obstacles. They had false teachers coming in, and um, they had the Nicolaitans out there uh, with their teaching about it. They would just walk so much in victory. They're floating in the sky already. They don't care if they're getting drunk or if they go to brothels or whatever. They can do whatever they want. Well, it's not that way because in the church just struggling through all this. And in the midst of that, I mean, the, the church kept down with, with the stuff, but something got lost. Something in the church got lost. If you know that you're struggling for a long time with something, there's something that gets lost after time. It's like slowly eroding away, and that's the first love. That's the passion that we have for Christ. That's the passion. God wants to fill our heart. He wants to make us passionate. But if we're going a long time through a hardship, then that's really hard on us. And so the encouragement was do not forsake the first love and kind of uh, kindle that fire again. So today we are talking about the second church, and the second church is called Smyrna. It's not called Sardis. I messed up in first service. Hey, I was at a wedding yesterday, and I was peer pressured. Do you know that your pastor can be peer pressured? Believe it or not, I was peer pressured in going out, and I knew I had to write a sermon, and I didn't get a chance, so I woke up early today to write the sermon for today, and people said, no, you can come out, you can come out, you, you don't need to know, have any notes, you, you can do it. And I'm like, all right, so I messed up in first service, I kept talking about the church of Sardis, even though it was Smyrna. So your pastor, yes, there might be anointing on him, but I need to give God to work something, something to work with, right? And a little bit of sleep doesn't, doesn't do damage there too. So today we're talking about the, the church Smyrna, and we corrected the slides too. And I call the church, the church to whom the Lord is everything. The church to whom the Lord is everything. I want to ask you the question right away. Is the Lord everything for you? Or is everything else everything for you? You know, we have to ask ourselves the question, like, is the Lord, for me, everything? Like, no matter what I have in life, no matter what I lose in life, is God in the first place? Does he see it on the throne in my personal life? Let's go to uh, Revelation chapter 2. And it, it talks here about this church, and it, it starts out by saying, <clears throat> and to the angel of 
uh, the church in Smyrna writes, the words of the, fa- of the first and the last who died and came to life. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And I know the slander of those who say that they are Jews but are not and are of the synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you're about to suffer. There is hardship waiting for a church. There is tough stuff waiting for this church. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested for 10 days and will have tribulation. But be faithful unto death. Wow. (laughs) Wow. Be faithful unto, unto death. Here is the Lord walking in the heavenly realms in the room, and he looks now away, he has spoken to the church, to the lampstand of Ephesus, and now he walks over to the next lampstand, and he says, I see everything, everything that you're going to go through. And there's bad stuff coming your way. There's really bad stuff coming your way. But be faithful even unto death. And I just want to talk a little bit about the church because I, I think there is a very strong message here for us. Let's start with the church in Sardis. Ah, Smyrna, sorry. <laughs> yeah, you have to correct me on that. Church in Smyrna, Smyrna, Smyrna. The church in Smyrna was actually called one of the jewels uh, of, of Asia Minor. It was called the crown. It was like a crown city. They actually had like the, the ancient uh, to- uh, the, the coins that they had. There was a crown, a, 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 like a king's crown. On uh, the, There was a goddess of Smyrna, and the goddess of Smyrna was wearing a beautiful crown. And so there was something about the crown. Smyrna was one of the most beautiful cities in Asia Minor. It was all the way, it was just 50 miles north of, of Ephesus. Yes, if you have a map in the back of your Bible... You can even look it up. It most likely has the, the, those cities in there. Uh, Smyrna was just 50 miles north of Ephesus and was pretty much right at the coast. And the thing that is so special about Smyrna is it's different from Ephesus. Ephesus had all, it was actually also uh, right located at a large bay. But the salt water and, and the sea, the Aegean Sea, which was bringing a lot of silt, a lot of um, stuff. And so the, the, the bay was actually building up. And uh, this, the, the town of Ephesus constantly had to stay at it to, to dig out their bay so that they, they wouldn't just the shoreline wander off and get further and further out there. Smyrna never had this problem. Smyrna was a jewel. Smyrna, if you would just drive around the coastline and you come to the next bay and the next bay, was the Bay of Smyrna, and there you would see from the ocean a city on a hill sparkling just like a crown sparkles on, 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 a, on a king's head. I have here a book with me, and it says the seven letters to the churches. I got some, some background information out here, and this is what the book, uh, how the book describes Smyrna. No city in East Mediterranean lands gives the same impression of brightness and life. As one looks at it from the water and beholds it spread out on the gently sloping ground between the sea and the hill, and and clothing the sides of the graceful hill, which was crowned with its walls and towers. So you're looking it on from the sea. I don't know if you have ever had the chance to go on a cruise and see the Aegean Sea. Did you ever see the Aegean Sea? If you have not, you have not seen the ocean yet. <laughs> it is gorgeous. Jen and I, we had the privilege of doing a diving license there. But it is crystal clear water. It's, you, you can see under the water, I don't know, and it seems like endless. But it is the most beautiful uh, ocean right there. And if you come up like with a ship or with a boat to, to this bay of Smyrna, you would look up and you have these grassy green hills rolling. And in the, one of the, the, the middle hills is actually called the Hill of Pegas. And the Hill of Pegas, that's where the city was located, just like leading up and then covering the Hill of Pegas and had a couple of shrines there and beautiful temples and and everything. Just from an onlooker perspective, the city had everything. And it was located right at the the travel route, uh, coming from the ocean, going back into the inlands, uh, that was going like a a road that went directly to, to Rome. 
So it was all the tourists went by. And if anybody would ever go through Asia Minor in the olden days, they had to stop by Smyrna because it was the crown. You cannot miss. Did you ever go to a pretty city and you have to see the sightseeing spot? Because that's what all the good tourists do, right? Smyrna was one of those sightseeing spots that everybody had to, to see Smyrna and just get a glimpse of how beautiful it was. But so it was a city that had a lot of wealth. It was beautiful. Money just kept coming in. And actually, all the people living there were pretty wealthy. It was a very rich city. If you would be living in Smyrna, then uh, I'm sure the houses costed a lot more there. And if you would be living there, you, you, you kind of took care of yourself. It, it was a beautiful city. You are wealthy. And so everybody, even the churches at this point, they, they, were, they were rich. Uh, money was, was, um, was plenty. But then something happened along the way. Actually, Smyrna was called first among Asia and crown. They had the temple of Bacchus there, the goddess of Smyrna. Uh, there was a shrine to Homer, a shrine to, for uh, Tiberius and Hadrian, just a lot of different things. It was like this, this central hub for, for idol worship, you could say. But people came from near and far to just see the city. And, but the church in all of this, even though it was thriving, why does the scripture say here, I know your tribulation and your poverty. I know your poverty. And then it says, maybe your Bible says, in, it, says it in brackets, but you are rich. Like, okay, what now? Is it, is it poor or is it rich? Is it poor or is it rich? It was, the Smyrna was, and the church in Smyrna was in a very, very difficult position. Because toward the, toward the later half of the first century, the, the church went through a, a very severe persecution. See, in the first century, uh, Christians were not having their own churches, but they were hosting the church service where? At the synagogues. Not, just, not, not quite at, at house churches yet. But they were actually going to the synagogues. They were together with the other Jews. That was the place of evangelism. Jesus always went to synagogues to, to teach and to preach. He was standing up and reading scripture. And then he was preaching. And the Jews, they, they heard about who uh, the, the Messiah is. And about the coming hope. And uh, Paul, when, when he was traveling, he always went first to the synagogues too. <clears throat> so he was, Christians were welcome even within the synagogues. But then something changed. Over time, <clears throat> the attitude uh, toward the church has changed because there was so much talk about this Jesus all the time, that Jesus, the, 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 the Jewish peasant from uh, Nazareth, that he is the Messiah. And it, it just expanded. It got more and more. And at some point, the Jews just said, you know what? Enough is enough. We're going to kick all the Christians out. So all the, the Christians were expelled from the Jewish uh, synagogues. And from then on, they, they started to meet in houses. But uh, as the, the first century progressed, the persecution became more severe because Christianity spread. The faith spread. People on, in, in, at the temples, at the shrines, they were just praying to God all of a sudden. Everybody was believing in the Lord Jesus. And so uh, there was persecution that started, and the church went through a very severe persecution. In first, and it says here um, that they are being dragged that they're being put out of the synagogue of Satan, if it even calls. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 10. You know, this is the picture of the risen Christ in the heavenly realm talking to the church that the church is going to go through a severe persecution. But even in his ministry here on earth, the Lord already warned about the same persecution. And we have exactly that same picture in Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, verse 18, the Lord says, Behold, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Be aware of them, for they will deliver you over to courts, and they will flog you in their synagogues, and you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. They will deliver you over do not be anxious. And when they deliver you over, do not be anxious about what to say. The Lord already gives a picture that there will be a time 
when other Christians will drag other, uh, other Christians before the governor to accuse them. R listen to what verse 21 says. Brother will deliver brother over to death. Wow. And the father, his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated for my name's sake. It talks about a very, very, very se severe persecution, even with own, with, within own families. Now, all of this came to pass in the early church in the region and in the city of Smyrna. When all of a sudden things changed, the Jews kicked them out of the church, and all of a sudden uh, the Jews would be dragging the Christian um, if you come from a, a, a country with an uh, Islamic background, if I, I, I knew a, a guy once who came from Iran, and I met him actually in, at a ministry outreach in Hull, England, and I was, I was just with him there, and we all, we, I, I was leading a missions team, and I was just put to his home, and everybody else was having uh, fancy homes, and I, I knew that he, he, he was in asylum, and I was like, well, why am I stuck with this guy now and I was kind of like unhappy about that but anyway I, I, I was there and uh, spent the night there and I kind of got to know uh, this guy and this guy just started to sharing about the persecution that went on in his home country and it, it just wrecked my heart how he said that actually uh, the court is uh, the court case is happening right now and very soon here is coming up and uh, it doesn't look good for him and he's in danger they will send him back to Iran, and I said, okay, well, what's going to happen then when, when they're going to send you back? And then he started just crying. He had no words. He knew where he was coming from. He was flogged there in, in, when, when he was held in prison, and one day his dad came to prison and said, I just want to visit my son. Uh, can, I, can I go out on the street with him? And they, It was different back then, but he, he kind of led him out. And he gave him all, he sold his house, he sold his car, he sold everything that he had. He gave his son airplane tickets and he sent him off to fly to England to literally flee because he, he would have been put to death in prison. And so the, the father then actually ended up in prison and the son bailed and he went to England. But now he was in danger of being sent back there and he knew that if he will be sent back there, he said, the prison guards, they will await him there at the airport, and he will be lucky if he makes it back to prison. So very severe, very severe persecution. Just imagine here, the church of Smyrna went through a very severe persecution. And um, back then in the Greco-Roman days, if there would be somebody who would uh, tattletale, do you like tattletalers? tattletale on other people so there would be tattletalers that would just literally accuse somebody and kind of go to the chiefs and to the governor and say hey this guy has done something bad there's something off with that person and if that would prove right they would actually come in strip them of all their possessions sell everything that they have and then 10 percent of their entire assets and worth would go to the one person who tattletaled that it was a lucrative business for a lot of people when, when they knew that the government was actually against Christianity. And so a lot of people were, were dragged out. Family members turned against family members, fathers against sons, sons against uh, their, their parents. It was just a horrible, horrible time. And in all of this, you have this picture about the Lord seeing what's going on in the church, how in the family so-and-so there's devastation coming. There's devastation going on. They're being dragged to courts. Back then, prison was not prison like today. You were only held there until your trial, until the sentence was spoken over your life, and then uh, you were executed, and that was basically it. And the Lord looks at his church members in, in Smyrna, and he is compassionate. He has no rebuke for the church because they're going through a really, really tough time. And as they're going through this tough time, the Lord looks at their circumstances, about what's going on in their families, how a city that seemingly should have everything, a, a city that should be filthy rich with, with money coming in all the time, it's called the crown and the jewel, and yet their own people, they're, they're living in poverty, they're being dragged to court, the governors, they're executing people left and right. Just imagine all of a sudden a, a, a police official knocks at your door and he leads you as the family household leader, he leads you off 
and then maybe the next day they come back and say, I'm sorry, he's gone. He will not come back anymore. All of you out of the house from now on is not your, you're getting depossessed, everything that you have. You lose your house, you lose your boat, you lose your fish house, and everything else. You just lose everything from one day to the next. And, if, and then you figure out, actually, it was your brother that, that tattletailed on you, that you have come to believe in Jesus Christ now. See, the church was going through a very, very uh, a severe persecution at this point. And even though the, the city was rich, it, it, it created an extreme poverty for the church at this point. And for me, it was fascinating early this morning when I was just reading that how, how sweet and how tender the Lord encouraged this church. And I believe that there's an encouragement for us when, if you're in a place in life where you feel like, you know, there was a, a point in, in our life when we had everything. You, you, maybe you had a house. You, you had a car. You would make ends meet and everything seemed to work out and you just had everything. And all of a sudden, si situations change. Uh, you feel like at one point the rug was, was pulled from underneath your feet and everything is, is, is fragile. Uh, maybe there was a, a sickness within the family. All of a sudden, all, all the funds had to go uh, toward uh, the, the medical bills. And, and everything becomes fragile from, from, one, from one day to the next. And here's what the Lord says. You know, the Lord, when he introduces himself to the church, it is already key to what the church is going through. And in the end, the way that he sums it up, again, he sums it up in a way that is key for the church based on what they're going through. And this is how the, there's two things that the Lord says to the church. He says, I am, and he says, I will. And I want you to kind of highlight those two things. In the very first, in, in verse 8, he says, To the angel of the Lord in Smyrna, write the words of the first and the last. Basically, he introduces himself that I am, I am the first and the last who died and came to life. He introduces himself to the church that's being dragged to courts, to a church where people die all the time. He tells them, I died and I came to life. And in me, you have this life eternal. And whatever you had once and you lost that, listen, I am the first and the last. I knew everything that you had. I know everything that you're going through. And I, I am the last. I am the last man standing. And you will be standing with me in eternity. The Lord introduces himself to the church and says, I am the first and the last. I'm the Alpha, the Omega. I, it's all, it, I am the person. And I, there is nothing, no persecution, no failure, nothing in life that you can ever go through will ever separate you from what? The love that we have from our Lord, our Father. Amen? That's good news. Amen? The Lord introduces himself as I am the first and the last. The one who died and came back to life. You know, it is important for us to know where, where our identity comes from. Our identity is not derived from stuff. Amen? We have stuff, but we have to be careful that our stuff doesn't have us. Right? We, we can have all the stuff in the world. It's all right. But if our stuff starts to have us, then something's off. We have to come back to the realization that our identity, who we are, is not in this earth. It's not from the, this world. It is with God. That he is the first, that he is the last, and that we have life with God in eternity. Our possession, our greatest treasure is with God. Yes, yesterday at the wedding, uh, Nathan and Magli, as, as we celebrated with them, as, as they were united together yesterday in marriage, um, I told them you know, from the scripture, I, I quoted to them where, where uh, it says, and let the word of the Lord be your possession. Let it be your greatest wealth, your riches. Let the word of God be your riches. You know, we, ha we all have different riches. I don't know if maybe you have a, a little safe in your house. We have a safe here in the office. We always forget the combination of it. We can never get in. <laughs> But maybe you have a safe in your house. And what's in this safe? 
Is it maybe jewels or is it maybe bags of money, maybe bags of gold? Don't raise your hand. But whatever it is, this is like, this is your treasure. Yesterday I said uh, to our, our dear couple, the, this, the word says, let the word of God be your treasure. Let the word of God be your treasure. Just imagine you have a safe in your house and it's the most precious thing you want to hide in this safe. And in this safe is the word of God. Because you know this is what gives you life, what gives you life in abundance, and what gives you life in eternity. And nothing else can give you life in eternity. Nothing else can give you life in abundance. There might be wealth in there. You can buy stuff. You can invest it in stocks, and it can be gone the, right the other day. You can invest it in a car or in a boat or in a new truck, and then it sinks through the ice. You can invest their earthly treasures in earthly stuff, and it will only last as long as the earth lasts, and maybe even less, because everything is going toward decay. But there is something that lasts into eternity, and that is the internal word of God. And we ought to have the word of God, our highest possession, our biggest asset is this. The biggest asset that we can have is this. So the Lord here reminds the church, it's like no matter what you lose in life, I am the first and the last. I'm the first and the last. Our identity has to be in Christ Jesus. Otherwise, we have a big awakening when stuff goes haywire. Amen. And stuff can always happen in life. We're never safe. The second thing that the Lord says, so first he says who he is and that our identity ought to be in him. And the second one is where he says, I will. You know, it's very, it's very telling here that the, the world is like, I, I see what's going on, how they're, what, what the governor is doing to you. I see what your brother is doing to you. I see what your children are doing to you. I see everything that's going on, but listen to what I will do. Listen to what I will do, because I have a plan for you too. It's not only what other people's maybe ill wish toward you, but I have a divine plan for you, and we know the plans that the Lord has for us. They're good, amen? They are to give us a future and a hope. And here is what the Lord says. I will give you the crown of life. It's like you look at your city. Your city is called the crown of Asia Minor. First among Asia, it's called. And on all the coins, on all the pictures, it's always uh, pictured as the crown. It's the jewel. And the Lord says, listen, be faithful unto death. No matter if they drag you to court, if they want to kill you, they will kill you. Don't focus on that. Don't be afraid of it. Who holds the keys? The Lord. Amen. We talked about it last week. Jesus holds the keys of, of death and Hades, it says. He holds the keys to eternal life. Do not be afraid of death. Be faithful unto death. Bear the witness, and I will give you, instead of the crown, the earthly crown. Smyrna was actually later on. It was uh, captured by, by uh, a, a couple of rebels and, and the city walls and stuff. It was all destroyed. So even the wealth, the all, everything that they had, it was gone in one, one uproar. And the, the, the city was devastated later on in the centuries. But just think about that. They called themselves, they had the biggest crown. They had the biggest wealth. They called themselves first in, in Asia, having everything, and it can be gone just the next month. And here the Lord says, but you be faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown. Don't worry about the crown, the earthly crown, with sparkle gems and everything that's in this earthly crown. Let me give you a crown, because my crown is going to be the crown of life. Hallelujah. I want a crown of life. I don't care about sparkly gems in my crown or something. I want the crown of life because the Lord gives us life, life in abundance, life eternal. And the Lord wants us to focus on this no matter what we go through. You know, maybe you're, you're going to, we have students here. I love you guys in the first row. Can you always do that? <laughs> Keep that up. I love that. Yes, give them a big hand. I love them seeing there. But may, maybe you guys as students, you, 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 you're going through, through college and not everybody sees God in the same way like you do. And there is a lot of bullying. Maybe kids in school, there's a lot of bullying. Or if you go to work uh, with the work colleagues, there's a lot of bullying. There's a lot of tattletale. 
There's a lot of gossip. I mean, it, it even says here, slender. They will slander you. You know, it's like the early church went through that. The early church went through slander. Are we exempt from slander? No. There's going to be slander. But in all of this, don't forget where your identity is, that the identity comes from the Lord and that he has a plan too. He says, I will give you life. The life that we have, it comes straight from the Lord. It doesn't come from stuff. Stuff is stuff, and it can be gone the next moment. But the Lord gives life. The word of God is our highest possession. Amen? Amen. As we come to the, to the table of the Lord, I, I urge you to remember that. You know, this is, this is where I feel like the I in, the, in our I church part is. When we look to the church in Smyrna, you know, maybe we have people here at Riverside that, that do well. God bless everybody who does well. Maybe you have done well too at some point, but maybe right now you go through a really difficult time. The Lord wants to remind us our identity is in Him. We are celebrating right now the covenant with the Lord. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord Jesus, He said, this is my blood, the blood in my covenant. He bound us to Himself so that we can have life eternal. Amen. And he has a plan for our life. If the communion service are ready, come on forward. Let's partake in communion here. And as you hold on to the elements, I just want to urge you to. What priority does the Lord have in your life? Smyrna. I called Smyrna the church for whom the Lord was everything. Everything, you know. Sometimes when we only when we lose everything, we come to realize where our true treasure lies. Our treasure is in the Lord. So as you hold on to the elements, just think about that. Where is your treasure? What's in the safe of your heart? Is it stuff or is it the Lord that's in your heart? And if you feel like that you have failed in some area, just go ahead and bring it to the Lord right now. Make amends. Allow him in. Allow him to be the first and the last. Make the Lord our first and last.
As the Lord made the covenant with us, he gave his own body to be broken for us. He said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. And then after he gave thanks, he, he took the cup and he blessed it and he said, this is the covenant, which is a relationship, it, it's a contract, it's binding us to himself. This is the covenant that he wrote with his own blood for us so that we can be in Christ, so that we can have this highest possession in life. Lord, we thank you for the high price by which we were purchased. That you purchased our hearts and our minds and we just want to give it freely to you. We thank you. We are standing in your service. And as we remember your sacrifice for us, Lord, help us to make you our highest priority, that your word will be the highest treasure in our hearts. We want to put you on the throne in our hearts and in our lives. I think about you. Hallelujah. We give you all the praise and glory and honor. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Let's eat and drink together. Hallelujah. Let's stand together. <clears throat> if the altar team is here, would you guys come forward? I just want to offer prayer again. Maybe if you're going through a hard time right now and you feel like that you have lost everything and Maybe it's a wake-up call that gets your attention this morning and you feel like, you know, you, you just want somebody to come alongside to pray for you. Don't go home right away and just take a couple more moments and just have our, our team pray for you. Amen. Lord, we thank you for this church service today. We thank you for your reminder through the, the church in Smyrna that had to go through it all. A church that had to go through it and a church for whom you were first and last. They had their identity in you, and no matter what stuff was happening around them, they were faithful unto death because you hold the keys of death, and all life and the crown of life is with you, the treasures of life, the spoils of life. We have life in eternal through you. Hallelujah. As we go into this week, as we... Um, hear about countercultural, where our culture is at. Help us to not forget that our highest price, our highest possession is in you. Hallelujah. We give you all the glory and honor in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Have a wonderful Sunday. We'll see you on Wednesday or next Sunday. <clears throat>